Well, it's that time again. Disney Plus has dropped another MCU show, this time Loki Season 2. I wasn't the world's biggest fan of Loki Season 1. Compared to what came out during the initial run of D Plus shows, it was one of the better ones, but it's not really saying much. Uh, some of Season 1 I liked, some of Season 2 I didn't care for, uh, some of Season 1 I didn't care for. So yeah, uh, it's, it, it's a mixed, Loki Season 1 was an overall mixed bag. So, <clears throat> well... Now it's time to talk about Season 2, a show that dropped without any hype, and I forgot that it even came out. <clears throat> so, yeah, with all that being said, let's get right into it. Kicking off with Episode 1, Ouroboros. Alright, so Season 2 pretty much starts off where Season 1 picked up, where Season 1 left off with Loki being in an alternate, in an alternate version of the TVA. <clears throat> yeah, so Loki's in a timeline where no one knows who he is, Mobius doesn't know who he is, the TVA doesn't know. Basically, the TVA is in total chaos, and this is because Sylvie killed He Who Remains at the end of Season 1. And this is what is pretty much causing Loki to do something known as time slipping, where he's going between the past and present. Nobody knows, nobody in this version of the TVA knows who he is, Mobius don't know who he is, the other employees don't know who he is. Uh, they slowly start to realize <clears throat> that members of the the employees of the TVA are from branched timelines and now and that, and they go to convince these new authority figures and judge gamble and general docs who have taken up leadership position from uh, Renslayer who is now missing about about this issue and they are given the order to stop to stop eliminating branch timelines then Morbius B15 and Loki pretty much <clears throat> then Loki pretty Morbius B15 uh, start uh, uh, arming up the TVA in a mission to go find Sylvie. Like I like how a show about Loki is already is already continuing the so the storyline of Sylvie. Like Sylvie is the is the primary character, and Loki's a backup dancer in his own show. <clears throat> yeah, but before Loki and uh, Mobius do that, Loki gets uh, time slipped into a meeting with these judges, uh, Judge Gamble and General Dox, and pretty much tells them about the impending doom of the Kane variants, and this is what leads them to go find sylvie uh okay sure whatever uh yeah the first half of this episode was extraordinarily confusing it was a recap show the entire time i was watching it i'm just like i have no idea what's going on i'm i'm like i had to read up on this episode before i did the review just to get a general idea of what the hell i was watching what the hell people are talking about because <clears throat> when you do stuff that involves multiverse and time travel the writing is going to be convoluted, it's not going to make sense, and it's going to contradict what was already set up in MCU lore. I mean, that's why uh, that's why when the MCU introduced the multiversal stuff, like, I'm not really overly enthused by multiversal stuff, I've, by the multiverse, I don't hate it. But if you go, but if you have people who have no idea about it and don't know how to, and don't do the research to make it make sense, then it's going to suck. <laughs> but yeah, to make a long story short, the first half of this episode is just introducing these two characters, introducing the threat of Hero Who Remains coming to the TVA or his variants coming, doing an invasion or whatever. And now they're off to find Sylvie because she, as her actions at the end of season one, is the cause of all of this. Okay, fine, roll with it. Now we get to the half of the episode that I did find to be enjoyable, and I actually did enjoy, and that is where Loki and Morbius meet up with a character known as. <clears throat> known as Ouroboros, who is a repairman for the TVA who goes by the nickname OB, played by, Ku by Ki Hyoi Kwan. Short round from Indiana Jones. I'll say this. I think these three have very good chemistry with one another. I thought their, I thought their back and forth bantering was very, very funny, even though I think that what they were saying was utterly and totally confusing. But more or less, OB and <clears throat> OB knows what's happening to Loki. Loki is time slipping, going between the past and present, and the only way for it to stop is that he has to prune himself. Now, if this is not successful, then everyone's going to pretty much have be be reversed, in which their flesh is going to be ripped off their body, and they're going to look like Frank from Hellraiser. Like, okay, that's cool. But before all that, uh, you have this running gag of uh, OB recognizing Morbius, calling him an old friend, yet Morbius has no recollection of this man. And it's <clears throat> basically said that they met 400 years ago by accident, but Obi remembered it, while uh, Morbius had no has no memory of it. We also see uh, Loki going back and forth to the past and present, talking to Obi, trying to tell him the uh, tell him what's going on. And it very very it, it was very funny, but also 
yet extremely confusing. More or less, <clears throat> Obi go, uh, Loki goes into the past and Loki goes into the past and tell and tells Obi that he's time that he's time looping and Obi has this uh, device that can that can prevent something like that. So more or less Loki, uh, Morbius has to go through a temporal loom and Loki has to prune himself at the same at the, uh, at the same time in order to stop in order to stop the uh, branching of the timelines and stuff like that. It's extremely convoluted the way it was explained. It's very just convoluted when you're watching it on screen. More or less, their mission is successful with Loki being pruned by a mysterious person at the last possible second. And once this happened, Mobius and Loki are going to resume their mission to find Sylvie. We get a mid credit scene of Sylvie going into a McDonald's, wanting to try everything in McDonald's and her having a smile on her face. Yeah, that's episode one in more or less a nutshell. Did my best to try and streamline it and make it make sense. Um, overall... Episode 1 wasn't a bad start to the season, but it wasn't a great start to the season. The first half is just whatever. The second half is more or less very entertaining. Uh, even though, But it's really entertaining because of the back and forth bantering between Hiddleston, Quan, and uh, Wilson. If these three were not in the second half of this episode, then this episode would have been a gigantic just what the hell's going on, I don't know, and I'm, lo and I'm really starting to care less and less as you start to talk. But yeah... That's episode one. Let's see how episode two goes. All right, time for episode two, Breaking Brad. The overall plot line of this episode is as follows. Loki and Morbius have to team up to try and find the location of Sylvie. They do so by traveling to 1977 to interrogate a rogue agent by the name of Brad Wolf, AKA Hunter X5, who had abandoned his post and pretty much decided to live life in the sacred timeline. After Loki and uh, Owen Will, after Oki, Loki and Morbius find this man, you have a mildly entertaining chase scene, which eventually leads to Brad being captured and being placed in the TVA, where Loki and Morbius more or less use parlor tricks and mind games to interrogate Brad and, and, and have him finally break the location of where Sylvie is. <clears throat> and Sylvie, of course, is working at the McDonald's that we had seen her walk into in the episode prior. <clears throat> Loki and Sylvie have a heart to heart. Loki talks about how uh, <clears throat> how the timelines are in danger, about how he who remains has got many variants, and that if Loki and Sylvie and if Sylvie doesn't join the cause, then everything around them is going to perish. Everyone will die. <clears throat> While all the while, uh, Hunter X Five keeps information to himself about General Dox, who was a character introduced in the first episode, planting bombs all around the uh, <clears throat> planting bombs all around the timeline as a, as a way to kill off and prune um, <clears throat> on, uh, uh, as a way to prune and kill everyone. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, that's basically the episode, episode two. It's okay. I mean, it's more entertaining than episode one. It's a little more streamlined, more easier to follow. It's not throwing any psychobabble nonsense at you. I don't think it was all that fantastic, but I do think it has some decent moments. You know, I like how Brad tries to get into uh, Loki's head, kind of playing a comedic version of Hannibal Lecter, where he tries to get in the head of Loki and Morbius, and then they turn the tables, and they pretty much use torture tactics to get him to confess <clears throat> and make sure to create the illusion that they're going to kill him when they're really not. <clears throat> I actually like that. I like how we get hints that Morbius does have an aggressive side to him when Brad does get in his head. And Morbius kind of has an introspective moment about how he likes being in the TVA and that he's really afraid to find out what his life could be like on this secret timeline. Now, he brings up the idea that he he preferred that his life not be a good life because having a good life in his, in his mind would make him just ponder and think about that. Like, <clears throat> So I like that. We get a little bit of an introspective moment with Morbius that doesn't take that, that you know, it doesn't make him in, into a, a soy boy or anything like that. But it, you get that moment of, you know, what would life be like? I kind of enjoy that. I kind of like that. It added, it added a nice dimension to Morbius's character. <clears throat> and Loki is just Loki. Uh, you know, they retread the whole thing of Loki and what he did in the first Avengers movie, how he's a villain. And they and that's how Morbius and, and Loki got the idea to torture Brad through mind games and illusions and tricks. <clears throat> Hence how we get to... And so we get to Brad leading them to Sylvie, who's working at McDonald's, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, at the end of the day, I think episode two was solid. It was mostly solid. It ends with Sylvie. 
So uh, basically the episode ends with Morbius, Sylvie, and Loki trying to defend one of the timelines. But ultimately, you know, failure does happen and Sylvie ends up leaving with one of the Tempads. There's also this subplot of Casey and Obi working together to try and find Renslayer, which they eventually do, also at the end of the episode. And we also find out that Miss Minutes, who is a minor artificial intelligence, this auto yeah, Miss Minutes has been revealed to be in cahoots with Renslayer. So, okay, sort of interested to see where this all leads. So, um, when all said and done, I thought episode two was okay. I thought this was a fun little episode. I liked, I liked, I liked most of it. Some of it was okay, and some of it was just. It was meh, but not all the way meh. It was good, and I'm not gonna lie. I, I got, I had a little fun with episode two. It was entertaining to me. So <clears throat> let's see what happens with episode three. Okay, so episode three, 1893, sees Loki and Mobius traveling to Chicago, 1893, to find a variant of Kang known as Victor Timely, for they need his essence in order to stop a temporal loom from destroying the TVA. This temporal loom was established in episodes one and two, and it's pretty much the overall season uh, season thing, is to stop the temporal loom from destroying everything. So season three, so episode two is more or less uh, the continuation of that plot line, while also giving us uh, Renslayer and Miss Minutes and establishing the uh, <clears throat> and establishing the idea of these two working together, as they're also on the search for Victor Timely. Uh, so yeah. Episode 3 to me was decent. It was a decent episode. Uh, the main takeaway I like from this one is the fact that it took place mostly in 1893. I like that whole aesthetic. I like the look. I like the production design. They did a really good job at capturing the essence of, uh, late, of uh, late 1800s Chicago and the World's Fair. I like the whole idea of Victor Timely being a very, very early variant of Kang the Conqueror, who is, who is a genius inventor bound by the technology of his time. I actually liked Jonathan Majors' performance as Victor Timely. To me, his performance seemed much more natural than he was as Kang in Ant-Man and, and then in Quant than he was in Quantumania. That's just me personally. I actually, I actually liked his performance. I liked him as like this timid, this uh, timid man who makes these inventions, but he's also a con artist as he, as he sells these, he sells these prototypes that don't always work. <clears throat> like, I like that little aspect to Victor Timely's character. I thought that was actually really well done. Uh, the whole idea of uh, Renslayer and Miss Minutes delivering the TV8 guidebook to a young Timely and pretty much these two shaping him to what he is. You know, that was a decent idea. Um, I think it's, re it's more or less revealed that Miss Minutes is more or less the orchestrator of everything. Uh, voice one voiced by the very very talented Tara Strong, uh, Miss Minutes and Renslayer in this in this episode they were okay. Uh, I wasn't really overly fond of Renslayer in the first season. My thoughts really haven't changed much in this season. Uh, the show kind of sort of teased a budding romance between her and Renslayer, but then they do a twist and it ends up being Miss Minutes having a, having a romantic feelings for Timely instead. <clears throat> uh, she gives this whole speech about why. Uh, about why she was never given a human body and why she's just this artificial time clock. <clears throat> you know, so, okay, that was interesting. Uh, I, I would like to see how more this plays out in a very weird, in a very weird and fascinating way. <clears throat> so, you know, that's that. Uh, the stuff with Loki and Morbius and their social timely, it was entertaining. You know, seeing these two guys walk around eight, uh, 18, 18, 1890s Chicago at the World's Fair, was entertaining seeing all the like seeing the productions seeing like the how they orchestrated the sets and stuff like that all the references and stuff like that low-key getting irritated by seeing a replica of the norse gods and him just being like this is a gross misinterpretation of, of his culture or something like that you know that was like a nice little rib tickler rib tickler uh, i like the whole i like victor timely's whole demonstration i thought that was actually well done and that's where Jonathan perform. And that's where Jonathan Majors' performance really shines, is when he's giving this presentation. And more or less, this this whole episode is an extension of the mid credit scene from Quantum Mania. So, I like I I enjoyed that aspect for the most part. You got some entertaining chase scenes here and there with these robber barons trying to uh, trying to chase, uh, trying to get Timely's inventions and get a little revenge for him swindling them and stuff like that. <clears throat> Well, at the same time, you got Renslayer and Minutes working with uh, uh, working with Timely to escape the clutches of Loki and uh, of Loki and Morbius, which leads to a showdown 
in one of Victor's uh, labs in Wisconsin, which we see Sylvie make the make the uh, <laughs> which we see Sylvie make an appearance. And I like how a show about Loki continues more or less to be a show about Sylvie because when you watch this show, Sylvie has more connection to the major plot points in this show than Loki does. Loki's more of a specter. Expe Loki is ex as a spectator in his own show, which is a shame because Sylvie has all the juice. Sylvie has the one with the grudge against uh, he who remains, Kang, and wants to kill Victor Timely. She's the one who has a grudge against Renslayer. Loki is just there. You know, I'm not a fan of this. I'm not a fan of, I mean, it's bad enough that you, could, you can't let Loki die. At least let him be the star of his own show and not a spectator in his own show taking a backseat to what is a secondary character. So yeah, still not a fan of that. Loki, to me, has no arc in this... So far, in the first in these three episodes, Loki, to me, has no arc. Sylvie has most of the arc. And that's... That's stupid. This is not the Sylvie show. This is the Loki show. And it's a major, major flaw to this thing. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, uh, Sylvie and Renslayer have a face-off in which Sylvie pretty much tells Renslayer that she wants to take a seat at the table and she knocks her into a temp pad which places her at the Citadel at the end of the first season which we see the corpse of He Who Remains and Miss Minutes and, and Miss Minutes pretty much ominously says that she knows secrets to He Who Remains and knows secrets about Renslayer that are to be revealed very very soon. Uh, yeah so more or less that's episode three. Overall decent not as good as episode two but it does have things that I did like. I like, more or less, I like the time period of episode three, and I like Jonathan Majors' performance as Victor Timely, which I thought to me was a more natural performance, and he, did, and he, and he felt, it felt more real. <clears throat> uh, I wasn't overly fond of Renslayer or this budding romance or the whole thing, but I am interested to see where this thing goes with Miss Minutes and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, that's episode three. 1893. Let's see what happens in episode four. Okay, episode four, Heart of the TVA, picks up where episode three leaves off. Renslayer is in the Citadel at the Age of Time with Miss Minutes, and Miss Minutes reveals that pretty much Renslayer and He Who Remains were working together as He Who Remains had Renslayer as his more or less the commander of his army, and then gave the order to, ha to have her mind absolutely wiped. And Renslayer is not too thrilled about this. So this leads to both Minutes and Renslayer going to the TVA to take control, in which they pretty much, uh, in which they pretty much obtain the services of uh, Brad, B X Five, and pretty much kill General Dox and her loyalists. And then the two, and then the, and then this trio, then embark on chaos, trying to get to Loki, Timely and uh, Mobius as they tried to stop this temporal loom from destroying ev from destroying the TVA and everything else in general. So yeah, that's basically episode four in a nutshell. At the end, it's okay. I think episode four has got way too much going for it and it kind of acts like a season, like the season finale or a penultimate episode than it does like, then it does another story to be told. I mean, the ending, kind of leaves it very ambiguous but we all know that there's still two episodes left so i think our heroes are going to be just fine <clears throat> but i do like how uh, i do like what happens to victor timely and that was that was kind of unexpected <clears throat> uh yeah pretty much episode four is just the uh, it's just renslayer minutes just causing havoc in the tva with loki morbius uh, sylvie and timely and obi trying to stop this and trying to stop a threat that's basically all this episode is i mean you do have some good nice bits here and there i like the scene of ob and timely marking out with each other it's a night it's a it's a it's a nice bouncing off point from when kc met ob at a in an earlier episode and we get that fanboyness with ob with ob and timely with ob and timely i like that i like those little human moments uh i also like the scene of uh i also like the scene of uh sylvie Pretty much talking to pretty much talking down to Mobius in a way, pretty much condemning him from not wanting to find out what his pre TV TVA life was. Uh, this further 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 ex, uh, hints at the fact that we're gonna see a pre TVA Mobius, and I'm very curious to see what his life was outside of the TVA. That's one of this. That's one of the main things that this show that this that this season established that I'm the most interested in because everything else, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not really interested in it. <clears throat> 
I'm like, I'm not all that interested in what else this show has to offer except what was Mobius' life outside the TVA. Because more or less, this season has been... It, it's been a confusing mess. The explanation and how it tries to... And how it tries to explore everything is just very convoluted. This... This psycho babble talk in this show and in this episode hurts my brain to the point where I just don't know what these people are saying and I don't know what's going on. But the general gist of it is that they have to stop this temporal radiation from destroying everything in which Victor, you know, he... <clears throat> Victor more or less lobbies himself to try and do it and he's quickly killed in like, in like seconds... Because the second he makes it outside, uh, outside into this like uh, outside the TVA, he gets turned into human spaghetti, <clears throat> which is actually a pretty decent effect, and it came from completely out of nowhere. And this is what leads to a dark and gloomy, ambiguous ending in which this radiation thing explodes and it engulfs the TVA with everyone else inside of it. <clears throat> so that was decent. Uh, everything up leading to that, it was you know it was okay. Uh, Ob does a thing, does a thing where where the suppressing where the suppressing of magic is now done, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, Sylvie enchants uh, enchants Brad, which causes him to pretty much to prune Renslayer. Uh, we find out <clears throat> we find out that a past version of Loki was the one who pruned himself, which was something. So basically, in episode one. Loki was trying to do a thing and he got pruned. We we find out that it was Loki who pruned himself. A oh, big revelation. <clears throat> we waited four episodes to find out that the guy just that the guy killed him. That the guy pruned himself. Okay, whatever. Uh, Renslayer in minutes. They kind of go on a war path, killing General Dox and her minions. You know that was okay. That was fun. Seeing an oversized Miss Minutes destroy everything. Uh. And then we have a scene where Obi dis deactivates Miss Minutes and she kind of disappears. Uh, we'll see if she comes back. Who knows? <clears throat> so, honestly, truthfully, when all said and done, the only big takeaways I got from episode four was the ambiguous ending, which I kind of liked. The unexpected killing of Victor Timely, which came out of nowhere and which I actually really liked. And I like the character moments. I, I like the moments of Obi and Victor, you know, fanboying with each other. I like the whole thing of Victor dis uh, discovering a hot cocoa machine for the first time and, and being marveled by it. Like those little bits are what get my interest more in this show because the action isn't really all that interesting, and the overall and the overarching story is really not all that interesting either. It's just a temporal loom and a great threat happening, which we've seen a hundred times. It, I'm, I'm, I am more interested in characters just talking and interacting with each other and the idea of what was what was life pre-TVA. Like, we have this whole subplot of uh, B-15 wanting to discover her identity. Yes, in the last three episodes, B-15 is makes appearances all throughout this show, but I keep forgetting that she's in the show because she doesn't leave no mark on me. But she has this ongoing story of her wanting to dis discover what her true identity really is. <clears throat> you know... More or less, that stuff kind of has my interest. Everything else around it, it's whatever. You know, Sylvie still takes center stage over Loki <clears throat> in his own show, which I'm not fond of. But well, let's see how the last two episodes play out. Okay, so episode five, science fiction, picks up where episode four leaves off. The temporal loom has exploded. Loki is the only sole survivor. The TVA has been spaghettified and all of Loki's friends have been reset to their lives prior to the TVA. Uh, Mobius has been reset to a man named Don, who sells jet skis, is a widowed father of two sons. Uh, B-15 has been, has been reset to a child doctor. OB has been reset to a character by the name of Doug, who is a struggling inventor and author. Uh, and uh, Casey has been reset to Frank Morris, the only man to escape Alcatraz. Sylvie is the only one that retains all her memories. So basically, the entire episode is Loki traveling to different points in time, trying to convince his friends of who they are before the temporal loom explode. Before the temporal loom exploded, and <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty much it. This whole this whole episode to me was nothing but filler. It had a couple of decent moments here and there with the characters, but overall, it was filler. This is just a come down episode before we get to the big finale. Nothing really all that spectacular happens in season five. It's just Loki and uh, 
<clears throat> it's just Loki and Obi trying to figure out how to uh, retrofit, trying to figure out how to get everyone's memories back to when they were in the TVA. So that way they can continue on with trying to, with trying to save time. I you know what I have completely just forgotten what the overall plot line of the season is. To be honest with you, I can't remember for some reason because this this damn season has been so confusing and just so convoluted. I don't even remember what's happening right now. All I know that throughout this episode, Loki is time slipping and he's having a hard time trying to control it. And it's not until we get to the end of the episode where he finally learns how to control it after everyone starts to be spaghettified. And then he reset, then he controls his time slipping and resets everything back to how it was before the explosion at TVA, but just by focusing on Obi. That's basically it. This entire episode is just 45 minutes of just Loki going from different person to different person, trying to jog their memories with nothing really all that interesting happening. The only thing that this episode did that got me intrigued was seeing Mobi Mobius's life before the TVA. As a man who's who lives a simple life of selling jet skis and trying to raise two sons on his own. And I like the whole idea of of this ver of uh, Mobius, you know, reluctant to join the reluctant to join the crusade because he's more worried about making sure his kids are protected and not alone. <clears throat> I like that stuff. I that is that's the more that's the most interesting aspect of this whole episode was Morbius. Uh, Sylvia retaining her memories, it's not really, doesn't really shock me at all because this is not the Loki show, this is the Sylvie show. She's the one with all the problems, she's the one who's really the undercover star. Loki's just a backup dancer who drives the plot. Sylvie's the one that gets all the, that gets all the character moments and all the character progression while Loki is just Loki. <clears throat> But I'll, I'll say this, this show did give Loki a motivation for wanting to do the things he does. He wants to save his friends so that way he doesn't feel well, alone. At least Loki has got motivation. It ain't the world's greatest motivation, but at least he's got something to, at least you got something to latch onto as a viewer for the star of the show to have some sort of goal or end game in terms of why he does the things he does. <clears throat> but like I said, anyway, th this this episode is mostly just Loki traveling from to different periods in time and just seeing his colleagues before the TVA and seeing what their past lives were like. The only entertaining scenes I enjoyed were the ones where he interacts with Mobius's when he interacts with Mobius as a dad, and with Doug as a struggling inventor. And it's actually and of course it's Ob who's going to know everything, especially when Loki gives him a TVA guidebook and he was and he's able to create his own tempad. <clears throat> so I, I like that stuff, and I like the fact that Ob slash Doug is very knowledgeable in this sort of thing because he's a he's an amateur scientist and I like and, and once again uh K once again K Hu Kwan uh reinforces the fact that he's one of the better parts of this entire season like he's really really entertaining to see on screen and I do like his his bantering and his uh and the dialogue he has with Loki it's a lot of fun it's confusing and it's played for laughs but the way Kwan's delivery is just very entertaining to see <clears throat> So I like it, but uh, yeah, eventually, uh, eventually everything gets reset back to normal again, and we march on forward to the finale of this season. Okay, episode six, Glory's Purpose. Let's make this thing as short and sweet as possible. Make a long story short, Loki can time slip, as established in the episodes prior. He tries many, many times to top, to stop the temporal loom from exploding, but ultimately fails. So Loki, having the bright idea goes back to before Sylvie kills he who remains and he learns that the temporal loom is more or less a failsafe and that it's only there to protect the sacred time to the, to protect the sacred timeline and to delete everything else around it <clears throat> but uh, I think he who remains also says that in order to save it Loki has to kill Sylvie Loki unable since he, since Loki is unable to kill Sylvie he travels to different points in time he has a conversation with Morbius he also has the conversations with Sylvie. These these two these two separate conversations more or less explain to Loki that he has to see a big picture and has to make an ultimate has to make an ultimate decision. <clears throat> so, the end of this episode basically has Loki stopping the temporal loom himself and more or less becoming and more or less forming this uh, tree in which he becomes the new keeper of time in a way. <clears throat> yeah, Loki basically takes the the uh, dying branches of uh, the dying branches of time forms them into a tree like 
structure and he now is now and he's now the overseer and will spend the rest of, of his uh existence overseeing time hey listen if this is what it takes to retire to retire the character of loki it's fine with me because i'm sick and tired of seeing him but yeah more or less that's basically the end of the episode the epilogue pretty much makes reference to uh the tva now being able to monitor kang they make a reference to him in the quantum realm him being stopped by ant-man uh mobius mobius uh retires from the tva and goes to and sees his former life uh ren slayer is still alive and she comes face to face with Elioth. i forgot that when you get pruned you go to this desolate wasteland it goes to show you how much i actually like this show which i really don't <laughs> it's all right but yeah uh ren slayer is alive and now and then the show kind of leaves it ambiguous as to whether or not she survives her encounter with Elioth. whatever uh in terms of everything else uh victor timely never receives a tva guidebook as a child and that thus 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 he never becomes the man we see him throughout the throughout this season and uh yeah that's uh basically episode six of loki season two at the end of the day i thought season two was slightly better than season one but this show was flat out confusion <clears throat> the over explanation of trying to make this story work made my brain hurt you had some fun moments here and there loki in terms of a character arc was slightly better the characters the supporting cast around him were slightly better also uh every episode featured the character b15 and every time i kept forgetting she was in these episodes because i found her character to be absolutely boring uh but at the end of episode six she's now part of the tva council i believe and after mobius retires she basically promised she promises him a seat whenever he decides to return so good for you b15 um uh, in terms of this uh show's production values hey listen ain't gonna lie the show it looks fine for what it is the sets look good the costumes the wardrobe look good the acting all around is fine but the writing can be very very muddled and very very confusing the over explanation and under explanation of things is, is a head scratcher and when these characters are talking about the whole scientific thing I found myself trying very, very hard to pay attention because I just found this shit to be absolutely confusing. Over explanation nonsense. But yeah, but that's pretty much low key season two. Slightly better than season one. Giving it, gonna give, gonna give it a solid six out of ten. So yeah, those are my thoughts on this season as a whole. Let me know yours in the comment sections down below. Like the video and subscribe, and I'll check you back next time for more.